start the second plenary session for today. Okay, great. So welcome everyone to this second super exciting plenary session of the ISF Dijon. Today I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce you to our plenary speaker, Professor Sergei Guriev. Professor Guriev is a provost of Science Po Paris. He joined Science Po Paris in um, 2013 as tenure professor of economics, and previously he was um, directing the new economics school in Moscow between 2004 and 2016. Between 2016 and 2019, Professor Guriev was serving as a chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. His um, research interests uh, include uh, political economics, development economics, labor mobility, and contract theory. He has published on an incredibly long list of uh, international journals that we all envy, including the Academic Economic Review, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of European Economic Association. And I could continue for the next 10 minutes at least. He has also uh, served on the board of several prestigious companies, including uh, Eon Russia. Um, and uh, in 2006, uh, he was selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Among all his long list of other achievements, he has been, since 2017, a member of the Executive Committee of the International Economic Association. He is also a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London, a global member of the Trilateral Commission, a senior member of the Institut Universitaire de France, and an ordinary member of the Academia Europea, and an honorary foreign member of the American Economic Association. I think even by now, any one of us, even those like me who don't do political economy, are incredibly happy to be in this talk. And so I leave the floor to you, Professor. Uh, today we are going to listen to a very interesting presentation on the impact of politics and geopolitics uh, on the global economic performance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malvina. <clears throat> I will try to speak for uh, 45, 50 minutes to leave time for questions. I'm really honored and happy to be here. I actually plan to be in Dijon in person and bought train tickets, but unfortunately I had COVID and today I'm still COVID positive. So it's for your own benefit that I speak on Zoom and not not in person, even though I'm, I'm really missing uh, your great conference. So what I'm going to talk about is the return of the politics. Uh, 30 years ago, we would say that no longer we should care about politics because all politics will be liber liberal democratic policies, politics, and therefore policies that would be friendly to economic growth, to inclusive economic growth. But actually we see that in the last 30 years, the history decided to reject the idea of end of history, has come back, and especially in 2022, uh, when full-scale war in Europe started, uh, we uh, need to understand uh, the challenges to democracy better, what, uh, uh, what the populists are doing, what the autocrats are doing, and what wars and sanctions are meaning for the uh, economics. And that's uh, what exactly I'm going to talk about based on recent research about populism, uh, recent research about autocracies, and recent research on impact of war if on, uh, and on sanctions on economic performance. Now, uh, uh, as I'm going to argue, uh, in many ways, what we are observing today in all those dimensions is new and unprecedented. Uh, the rise of populism is historically high. Uh, a rise of autocracies in many dimensions is also quite high. And uh, the uh, war and sanctions are also unprecedented. In in interestingly, we live in the war of unprecedented sanctions. We've never seen as many sanctions and as broad sanctions. So I honestly, I, I have a lot to say, but I'll try to be very quick and I'll try to talk about impact of uh, all those uh, four things, populism, autocracy, war and sanctions. 
So I'll try to limit myself to a few uh, uh, aspects of, of, of this presentation. Uh, I've written a big survey on political economy of populism. I recently wrote a book on uh, autocracies, and uh, I've also spoke a lot, uh, spoken a lot, and written quite a bit on the recent uh, uh, war and sanctions. So I limit myself to the impact of those things for the economy. Now, just to summarize uh, what uh, you want to know about this uh, survey on populism, which is about 100, 100 pages, came out a couple of years ago in Journal of Economic Literature. So basically, in this survey, we look at hundreds of papers which came out after 2016 on populism. And basically, what we are saying is uh, we now have a working operational definition of populism. The broadest or the minimal definition of populism is anti-elitism and anti-pluralism. Uh, using this definition, we can actually identify uh, parties which are populist, politicians which are populist, and measure the increase in their vote share, in their presence in governments. And we can show, and I'll show you a couple of graphs, that uh, currently we live through peak populism. We've never seen as many populists in the uh, vote share and in uh, in terms of uh, presence in government as ever. And of course, uh, this week in France, you don't need any, any uh, confirmation of this. France is very, very much in the center of this debate. Um, so uh, I will not talk much about the drivers of populism. Uh, in this survey, we show that it's due to economic factors, long-term factors such as globalization, automation, short-term factors such as global financial crisis. Also, there is strong evidence, and this is uh, my own research as well, of mobile broadband, internet, and social media, which promote populist discourse. Less conclusive evidence on cultural issues, the role of immigration. Uh, there are some papers which show that immigration really matters, but the impact of immigration is nuanced, complicated, depends on composition, timing, scale, scope of immigration. Uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to talk about this. Now, what is important is that, uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about, is what populists do when they are in power. And this is going to be focus of my presentation today on populism. Now, I should say that research on what should be done about populists is much more limited because populism in power is reasonab reasonably new. So yet we talk about how you need to redistribute to those or left behind by globalization, automation, or crisis. We also talk about how we need to regulate social media to prevent them to be a fertile ground uh, for populist discourse, and also how we, we can try to reform our political institutions and reduce deliberative democracy and rank choice voting. But this is this is not the focus of my uh, presentation today. Just to show you a couple of graphs so you know where we are in terms of populism. So depending on definition of uh, populist parties, depending on uh, the countries you look at, whenever you look at vote share of populist parties in Europe, we are now uh, talking about the first decade of 24th century going from somewhat like 10 percentage points of vote share of populist parties to about 15 percent. And then in the second decade, we are going from 15 to 25, 30 percent. So it's a real takeoff in the second decade uh, of 21st century. But the first decade, we already observed a steady growth. And this is from a paper by Funke Schulare and Trebesh, which I'm going to talk about a few times today. This is a paper which looks at six large countries around the world, which account for about 95 percent of global GDP. And here you see populists in power. And uh, when you look at this, you see that 2018 was the best year ever in <clears throat> history of humanity um, uh, in terms of share of populists in government. So it's about a quarter of the sample. So we're talking about 16 out of 60 countries uh, where you have populists in government. Afterwards, uh, populists... Uh, uh, lost some election, but still today we're very much above the previous peaks. So this is this is the time which we are living in. We are in uh, times of unprecedented populism. And this data set goes uh, uh, back to 1900 when populism just started. And you see that 
we've never been to um, uh, such a such a important moment in history in terms of rise of populism. So as I said, I will not talk about uh, the causes of populism. I'll talk about the consequences. And basically, uh, uh, what has been studied very well before the recent rise of populism, economists studied uh, Latin American left-wing macroeconomic populists, you know, what happens when macroeconomic populists come to power, they overpromise, they print money, they are not disciplined in, disciplined in terms of budget, and that results in macroeconomic disasters. Now, we still have some populists like this in uh, different countries, some in Latin America, um, uh, some in uh, uh, European neighborhood, in Turkey until very recently, Erdogan also uh, conjured economic crisis out of thin air with his rejection of macroeconomic orthodoxy. Venezuela, of course, is like this. But most current populists are much more uh, aware of macroeconomic textbooks and have not destroyed their economy. So um, uh, I should say that when we talk about populism in power, there is actually a debate what is more dangerous, economic populism or political populism. And uh, in both cases, populists want to fight against elites and against pluralism, so they remove checks and balances. And uh, Roderick in his 2018 paper says that the most dangerous kind of populism is political populism when they undermine democracy. And so this is what we should be worried about. And actually today in France, you know, the debate is you have uh, extreme left party, which is proposing um, a economic program, which is unlikely uh, to be affordable for French budget. But then you have right wing populists who uh, promote the agenda of undermining political checks and balances. So which one is more dangerous? Roderick would say the right uh, wing uh, populists are more dangerous. Uh, and uh, there are books about this. Jan Werner Müller um, uh, explained how populism in power uh, colonized the state, undermined independence of civil servants and uh, representative democracies, how they use uh, funds of the state for mass clientelism, how they use courts to target their opponents. And so uh, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of that happening. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I'll say a few words how that's been quantified, but just be before going there, some methodological methodological notes. So uh, uh, in the recent years, economists started to use synthetic controls uh, to measure the impact of uh, experiments like Brexit or Donald Trump or other things. And so let me give you an example of Brexit. So Brexit happens, it's not been expected, or at least not everybody expected it. So it's a quasi random event. And now the question is, can we compare UK economy under Brexit to a counterfactual? And what economists do, they construct synthetic control, a doppelganger a counterfactual trajectory. The way they do it, they look before Brexit, they take all OECD economies and optimally select a weighted average of GDP trajectory of OECD economies to construct a counterfactual for the UK economy. So before, um, before the uh, uh, crisis, before, well, before Brexit, before the event, it's not a crisis, it's an event, uh, before the event, uh, this uh, weighted average of uh, 23 OECD economies should approximate GDP of the UK correctly. And then after the event, the trajectories may diverge and we compare the actual and counterfactual trajectories. And what Born, Müller, Scholarik and Sidlachik find is that actual UK economy un uh, underperformed by about 1.7 or 2.5% of GDP in year and a half after Brexit relative to counterfactual, what could have been without Brexit. So this is the chart. Basically what they do, they look at the data since 1995, quarterly data. The blue line is actual UK economy. The red line is counterfactual, which is weighted average uh, of OECD economies. The weights are uh, calculated. So blue line and red line are very similar to each other before the Brexit vote. And then we continue the weighted average and the actual. And you see that the actual is way below weighted average and the difference is about one percentage point a year, one percentage point of GDP a year. 
And this is pretty much the cost of populism. So this is the zoom in with other potential uh, projections, forecasts from Bank of England, from OECD. And whatever you do, you see a great divergence between what could have been continuation of growth and uh, what has actually happened, which is slowdown of growth. So this is synthetic control methodology, and it shows that populism is costly, and the cost is in the order of magnitude of one percentage point per year. Now, the economists have done the same exercise for Trump, and the result is until the pandemic, until 2020, that's the paper by the same authors, uh, Trump had neg uh, negligible effect on growth. No, no impact. Apparently, bad things that uh, have been done on trade were compensated by pro-GDP growth things on regulation. I don't talk about environment, I don't talk about inequality, but if we just look at GDP, Trump's impact on GDP was negligible. Now, I can go case by case, um, uh, and uh, I should say that there is a very important, a very important exception, which is Poland, peace, actually a piece outperformed the counterfactual mm -hmm. and uh, some people explain it by uh, successes of previous previous government some people uh, explain it by influx of cheap skilled labor before 2022 it was um uh, uh from ukraine some uh actually explain it by uh, very popular redistribution uh, family support program called 500 plus. So there are aspects, but Poland remains an ex exception. And Hungary, for example, is not an exception. Hungary is a negative, uh, negative example. And in particular, it's actually uh, under Fidesz, under Orban, we see a major increase in corruption. If you look at the corruption performance of Hungary, this is this black line uh, on the control of corruption measure or uh, worldwide governance indicators. Hungary has uh, converged down to the world average, which is quite low relative to its peers, which are countries from Central Eastern Europe, uh, which are all high income countries, which have uh, positive control of corruption and they're doing much better than Hungary. Anyway, uh, so let me get to the most important piece in, the, in terms of impact of uh, populace on uh, economy. This is paper by Funke, Shularik and Trebes. So what they do, they do uh, synthetic controls for those 60 large countries. So it's a global data set. And what they do, they compare the actual performance of a populist government relative to counterfactual, calculated exactly in the way that I described. And basically what they find is if populist comes to power, it's bad news for GDP. After 15 years, GDP goes down by uh, about 10%, a bit more than 10%. And this is actually true for left-wing and right-wing populists. Here, I don't show both trajectories. I show the difference between actual and counterfactual. So before the arrival of populists in power, this difference is zero, which is normal. This is how we calculate the counterfactual, right? And uh, after the arrival, the actual underperforms counterfactual, the gap is growing, and the gap arrives at about minus 12% by 15 years in power. So a populist being in power is bad, bad news for the economy. Now, uh, what they also say is, you can see if you run the same thing on inequality, on, on quality of courts, media freedom, uh, protectionism, you see the same picture. Populists in power try to raise trade barriers, try to undermine political institutions, try to undermine legal institutions, try to undermine uh, media freedom. Why? Well, because what happens, populists come to power, they uh, try to attack the elites, that actually uh, backfires because economy started to grow slower, populists cannot deliver on their promises, and they don't want to step down. So since they don't want to lose the elections, they start to subvert democratic institutions to stay in power. And what they also show in this paper is that populists are much more likely to exit in a scandalous way, uh, being overthrown because they don't want to leave after losing elections, or uh, they create a non-democratic uh, political system and so on and so forth. So uh, this is, this is uh, quite consistent with the papers I just cited before. So I will not talk much about the solutions to this problem because my goal today is to talk about implications. And if you have questions, I'll be able to talk about solutions. Now, 
let me talk about the impact of non-democracies. So to what extent non-democracies out or underperform uh, democracies? So basically, um, first and foremost, again, definition, because a lot of people say, well, can we draw a line between democracy and non-democracy? And the answer is, yes, this line is not very easy to draw. In theory, however, non-democratic regime is uh, a regime which is not democratic. So we need to define democratic regime. Democratic regime is a political system where rules of selecting leaders and policies are uh, uh, very clear. Uh, leaders and policies are chosen through reasonably fair, direct, competitive elections. Everything else is called non-democracy. So Leo Tolstoy, in his uh, book Anna Karenina, in the first sentence says, every happy family is uh, alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So all democracies are more or less defined in the same way. Non-democracies can be personalistic, party-based, theocratic, monarchic, and so on. But uh, basically, what is what unites them, they are not democracies. So um, it's actually a big part of the global population. Now, if you go back 200 years or 300 years, that would be 100% of global population. Uh, but uh, today we are talking about uh, 40 or 60%, depending on how you count. Now, what I show in this graph, uh, there is what's called polity score, which ranges from minus 10, perfect uh, dictatorship to plus 10, perfect democracy. And six is usually considered to be uh, minimal democracy. So for example, Israel is six, Switzerland is 10, and France, I think, is nine. And uh, on the horizontal axis, I show the distribution of global population. So about 1% of global population lives in uh, dictatorships minus 10. Another percent lives in dictatorships minus nine, another minus eight. And another, whatever, 20% live in dictatorships minus 10 because China is this big uh, distance. So basically, each dot here is a country. And here I just built a cumulative distribution function of global population regarding those scores. And you can see that this polity score, which is the most consistent and longest running score of evaluating political institutions, gives, uh, for example, India 9. India is a democracy in this score. And so you see that about 42% of global populations uh, in 2018, that's the last score uh, publicly available uh, and not contested, uh, lives in non-democracies and 58% lives in democracies. Uh, once you remove India from democracies, of course, that shifts into the opposite relationship with 60% uh, in non-democracies and 40% uh, in democracies. So I'll talk about India in a second. Again, now I just told about the share of global population. If you look at number of countries, uh, this is the same score, but not uh, weighted by population, just a share of countries. And you see that with all the talk of democratic recession, of the rise of autocracies, in recent years, we have democratic recession, but not a democratic. Uh, uh, well, democratic stagnation, but not democratic depression or democratic recession. So we have the same proportion. It's closer to 60% of the countries. Uh, uh, and uh, the rest are non-democratic regimes, which are called some, sometimes mixed or hybrid from minus six to six, or autocracies, which is below minus six. But the majority are six or above. And this is a big improvement uh, and this improvement uh, is much higher than, say, in 1970s, when the last wave of democratization began. And so we are now living in the world, well, in terms of number of countries, things are not that bad. They are not improving, uh, but they are not that bad. Now, uh, there is an alternative data set, which is called VDEM, Varieties of, Varieties of Democracies. And in this particular uh, uh, case, the shares are actually similar. You also have majority of countries uh, being either liberal democracies like France or electoral democracies. And for example, Hungary is an electoral democracy in this data set. Uh, and, uh, and then could be electoral autocracies or, auto or autocracies with elections or autocracies without elections. So you see also big progress in the last 50 years and last 70 years, big change in 70s, 80s and 90s and stabilization in the 21st century in terms of proportion of countries. Now, in terms of world population, uh, similar picture, 
But there is a, a big change in 2019 when this data set started to count India as a uh, non-democracy. And this jump is explained by India. If you count India as a, as a uh, democracy, you would still be at the same level of whatever, 55% of world population living in democracies in this data set as well. But overall, you see kind of optimistic uh, developments until uh, year 2000 and then stabilization. Now, what is worrisome is the share in global GDP. And this is, this is where we do see the rise of autocracies. This is a survey by my co-authors, uh, uh, Georgi Yegorov and Konstantin Sonin, which just came out in Journal of Economic Literature. And one of these charts is quite striking. So uh, you remember Soviet Union was a superpower and controlled a large part of uh, global GDP. Now China is actually taking over this role. And already by 2010, China uh, is overtaking uh, Soviet Union as share global GDP. And in total, non-democratic countries are accounting for a uh, higher share of global GDP than ever before. And they continue to grow. So if you can see the small numbers here, this is 2010. And then non-democratic regimes actually uh, rose to about 30% of global GDP. So, and again, as a share of population, it's still left, uh, uh, the share of population, they control for a bit more. So GDP per capita in autocratic countries is still lower. But as a share of global GDP, this is an unprecedented number. As I said, 2010 was already high, and uh, 2030 is even higher. So the question is, uh, are non-democracies outperforming democracies, and in which way? So in principle, you can imagine that autocrats should be interested in economic growth, because more uh, GDP, more resources to fight opposition, also to be popular, uh, to suppress uh, whatever dissent. Uh, this is in theory. But in practice, of course, the problem is that you need to uh, bribe your interest groups, what's called selectorate or weakened coalition in today's, in today's uh, 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 jargon of scholars of autocracies. And uh, actually running a dictatorship today is, is, is very, very hard because in particular, um, you cannot commit not to expropriate outside investors. And uh, when foreign investors come to you, you promise them that they will be protected. But since you don't have checks and balances, it's always hard for you not to expropriate them. And you always need money to compensate your closed circle, right? You need to co-opt your insiders. And so that makes, uh, makes it harder to run an efficient system. And uh, Hayek said uh, prophetically that it's dynamic aspects where uh, dictatorships underperform democracy, dynamic meaning uh, commitment not to expropriate investors. And basically, the idea is you can promise pro-growth policies, but of course, in order to provide checks and balances that maximize economic growth, you need to introduce institutions that constrain your capacity to extract rent and compensate your friends. And so that creates uh, an impossible trade-off, and many dictators just prefer rents to growth. If I have time, I'll talk about why some dictators manage to build a system where growth is actually quite successful, uh, but uh, these are exceptions. So once again, there are very few non-democratic regimes which manage to do that. Uh, just to tell you, uh, we talk about those issues in our book. We talk about how modern dictators operate, how they manipulate information, how when even they fail economically, they manage to convince people uh, that they are doing OK. And uh, yet, uh, this is always hard to be successful. Now, uh, just to give you an overview of where non-democratic countries are, there are very few rich non-democratic countries. In 1960s, they were not. If you look at the horizontal uh, level, this is GDP per capita. And if you look at uh, uh, various countries um, in, uh, uh, in terms of quality score, you see that non-democratic countries uh, are all on the left. So they are not rich. Now, today you have some exceptions. You have Singapore, you have uh, oil-rich uh, monarchies, which are in, in the range of high-income countries. But there are actually very few. 
most rich countries are actually democratic countries. Uh, my co-author Daniel Trisman wrote this paper uh, where he explicitly talks about this and says that uh, if you look at the polity score, and I remind you that in, in terms of polity score, six is the minimum score for democracy. Most rich countries are developed democracies. Now you also have Singapore, and you also have uh, petro-rich uh, uh, monarchies. And we li literally talk about one country here and uh, seven countries here. And these are the whole exceptions. And China is still not a high income country. And I'll talk about China in a second. So you would say that Singapore is probably an exception and uh, oil rich monarchies are so rich in oil that it's very hard to be not high income. So uh, do, we do have a correlation between level of income and democracy. To what extent one causes another? It's not clear. And a lot of people are saying that this is income which causes democracy to be consolidated and stable. And you can go back to Aristotle about this. Uh, I am happy to talk about why Aristotle thought that uh, given uh, votes to everybody may can actually backfire if these people don't have property. And uh, French, sociolo uh, sorry, American sociologist uh, 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 Lipset wrote an article and then a book about how democracy actually requires certain level of income and education. Uh, but uh, the, the way the causality goes is very important for policy, because if you believe that democracy causes prosperity, uh, you want to start with democratization and then prosperity will come automatically. Uh, if you think that high income causes democracy, then you can say, uh, I'll build democratic institutions later. Let me first develop uh, uh, economy, and then democracy will come later automatically. So these choices are made by many non-democratic leaders, and some of them actually talk about this literature uh, without uh, without uh, uh, knowing what uh, economists by now know. But anyway, so uh, I, I showed you uh, correlations between democracy and income. If we look at democracy and growth rates, that there is actually no strong correlations if you look at the cross-section of countries. Uh, there is actually a correlation between volatility of growth and level of democracy. So more democratic regimes have more stable growth, while less democratic regimes have more volatile growth. growth. All the growth uh, miracles and disasters have happened in non-democratic countries. And previously, people would just run those regressions in cross-country samples, and those regressions would give you all kinds of results depending on sample, depending on the time period. Uh, but uh, these were not actually very convincing. Now, what economists started to do in the last 10, 15 years, they started to use new, uh, more convincing empirical methods. Uh, a couple of years ago, Nobel Prize was awarded for developing these methods. And these methods have also been applied for studying the uh, analysis of regime change uh, and the impact of regime change on uh, uh, on economic growth. And so one typical study is Jones and Olken, who collected data on all leader death of natural causes of accident and impact on growth. Uh, so if uh, your leader dies because of a car crash or a plane crash, it's exogenous. And we can actually look at this as an event, exogenous event, and see whether growth is going up or down relative to countries which have not experienced such, a, a, such an episode. And basically, in non-democratic countries, the exogenous death of leader is actually good news for economic growth. It's about two percentage points per year. They give examples, but it's not just examples. We talk about 200 episodes in the, in the recent history. And uh, basically, if, uh, if you look at the episodes when non-democratic leader dies of non-social, non-economic driven reasons, it's actually good news for the economy. Now, there is a paper which also does this for democratization episodes, comparing countries before and after democratizations. And basically what they conclude is democratization results in an increase by one percentage point of GDP um, uh, growth. So GDP growth relative to the change of the uh, regime is going up by one percentage point, and this difference remains after 10 years. Uh, 
Another story is a uh, person in Tabellini who looked at similar countries, so they compared countries that undergo democratization and, uh, and uh, matched them with similar countries uh, based on probability of going to third democratization. So the logic is we have two similar countries, they have similar level of development, similar level of education, similar demographics, and one of them democratizes and the other one uh, remains non-democracy. Let's see what it matters in terms of growth, and we talk again about one percentage point per year acceleration of GDP growth. And finally, the most convincing paper in this line is a Simoglu Naiduri Strepo and Robinson, which is simply caused, uh, called Democracy Does Cause Growth, where they look at uh, uh, democratizations and they use instrumental variables, which is uh, democratization in a neighboring country. It is very well known that if your neighbor democratizes, probability to democratize for you is going up. And so they look at those uh, democratizations, they use democratizations in neighboring countries as exogenous variation, and they predict democratization in your country, they compare your country to similar countries around the world, and then they can calculate the impact of democratization on GDP, and basically over 20, 30 years, GDP goes down by about 20 percentage points. So it's, a, again, the same magnitude, which is one percentage point, uh, one percentage point increase in GDP Per year after democratization. Uh, interestingly, this is this is the uh, the uh, crude data. You see that before democratization, GDP actually goes down, which is normal. Democratization ha are likely to happen in countries which are doing less well in terms of uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, economic performance, and then it recovers and grows even more. Uh, these are all relative to matched data set. So it's not necessarily goes down, it just doesn't grow as fast as it could have been. And this is the econometric exercise. So relative to zero, this is the increase relative to zero, and you see the increase is about 20 percentage points over 25, 30 years. So uh, effect of reversal of democracy is not statistically significant, but it also goes in the same direction. So I should say that these uh, studies show that democratization causes growth, and democratization brings about one percentage point of GDP per year to economic growth. And I just told you how economists usually use recent, uh, recent uh, meta methodological advances to measure this impact. This debate is far from over, but uh, economists are now much more convinced that democratizations cause growth. Now, let me um, uh, skip that and uh, don't talk too much about uh, why certain non-democratic regimes are exceptions and why they succeed. I'm happy to talk about this, and I'm also happy to talk about uh, why some of them uh, uh, are not going, some of those exceptions are not going to last. But uh, let me switch to a much more relevant issue, which is uh, economic implications of wars. So again, this is mostly about autocracies because the democracies don't go to war with each other. Autocracies do. And uh, once again, history is not ended. We have a large scale war in Europe. So the interest in this topic increased a lot. Just first and foremost, let me remind you what orders of magnitudes we are talking about. So uh, the war uh, of uh, February 2022, um, happened in Europe, we probably are talking about 600 uh, uh, killed and wounded. Uh, this is um, not uh, unprecedented. For example, civil war in Ethiopia recently cost pretty much 600,000 killed. And uh, yet this war has shocked the world in a way uh, that uh, is not trivial at all. So let's look at the last pre-war forecast of the IMF World Economic Outlook for 2022 and 2023. So 4.4% for 2022, 38 2023. Uh, the war starts in February 2022. The next forecast is uh, April 2022. And the forecast for 2022 goes down by 8 uh, 0.8 percentage points, the next year 0.2 percentage points. So in total, IMF uh, removes 
one percentage point of global GDP right away. And so one percentage point of GDP right away is a trillion. It's a trillion dollars, right? So when we talk about this particular war in Europe, we talk about one percentage point uh, of global GDP or trillion dollars um, impact on the global economy. And some people would say that forecasters overreacted in March, April 2022. But if you actually look at the actual numbers, they are slightly worse in the uh, forecast of April 2022. You can say that uh, maybe other bad things have happened since April 2022. Yes, some good things happened as well. And if you on average believe that uh, nothing as dramatic happened uh, since April 2022, which was not priced in, uh, you can say that this forecast generally was on target. So we, we are talking about 1% of global GDP, so it's not trivial at all. So I'll talk to you about, in the last five minutes, I'll talk to you about two papers which have recently looked uh, into this question. And this is a paper by Chipilkin and Kochan, uh, who are uh, EBRD economists, who study correlates of war data set for two centuries. They also use synthetic control method five years before, five years after. Once they build a balance panel, their data set shrinks to 200 and then to 130 country wars. And basically their story is uh, that there is an impact of war, which is negative. There is an impact of war on GDP, which is negative. The year after the war ends, GDP is minus four percentage points lower than it uh, would be in the counterfactual. They also say that uh, the most important thing is whether the war is fought on your territory or on somebody else's territory, which is natural. Uh, and the effects are especially bad for uh, losers and non-initiators. So this is the main graph of the paper. So this is counterfactual before the war. This is counterfactual during the war, the first year of the war, the last year of the war, the first year after the war, and you see the difference remains important, doesn't really catch up. So the impact is uh, quite large, four percentage points of GDP. If you actually look, look at uh, on territory and off territory for off territory, uh, the effect is actually positive. I'll talk about this. War can be bad for your economy, but good for your GDP, because GDP in the wartime economy may measure wrong things like production of tanks, like salaries of soldiers and compensations for killed soldiers. But for a war on territory, it's minus 7% of GDP, which is huge. Uh, so uh, interestingly, uh, even for countries on off territory, sorry, the impact on TFP is bad. So when we talk about increase in GDP, this is not because the country is becoming more productive. It's because the country re allocates more resources to military sectors because productivity doesn't grow. So, and eventually the capital stock uh, doesn't grow. Uh, capital stock in countries on which territories, on whose territory the war is proceeding, suffers quite a bit. And population, again, if it's off territory, no impact. If it's on territory, population suffers a lot. So this is this was a paper published. Uh, it's it's not neither of these papers published. They're all very recent. There was a working paper published a couple of years ago. Now this is a paper uh, uh, published uh, also working paper which just came out this year. Uh, same data set, but for those sixty countries, sixty big countries for which uh, which account for uh, ninety five percent of global GDP. So this team of researchers looks at wars in those 60 countries in 150 years. They do a much more careful work on exogenity of war to business cycle. So the war is not started because the economy is not doing well. So they study the narratives, the casus belli narratives. And in their data set, the output decline is much bigger, not 7%, but 30%. Uh, but they uh, also look at inflation. Inflation also has a bad outcome. And they also show that neighboring countries, depending on the distance, suffer. And the closer you are to the war, the more you suffer. So this is the main graph of this uh, paper. Uh, large wars above uh, 10,000 casualties. So for large war, the impact is even, is even uh, higher. And so this is, this is the impact on uh, uh, GDP and on inflation. So um, 
And uh, yeah, so this is uh, uh, when I said output decline, this is after uh, uh, the whole period. So this aggregate out output decline, and this is per year. So uh, this is for neighbors. And let me just say one thing about sanctions. So sanctions uh, uh, are not studied well yet for several reasons. We live in a period which is unprecedented. So if you want to study previous research on sanctions and take lessons from those, that would be misleading. Because just to look at this chart, if you look at this chart and look at who's been sanctioned and when countries have been sanctioned, you see that uh, after February 2022, sanctions have been an order of magnitude larger than before, uh, especially for Russia. Russia is now the world champion in sanctions. Some of these sanctions are very small, like sanctions on some individuals. Some of these sanctions are huge, like uh, freezing $300 billion of uh, uh, sovereign uh, reserves, of uh, central bank reserves. But still, just in the sheer number of sanctions, 2022 is a, uh, is a great turning point. And so uh, learning from what has happened before is probably misleading. Also, what is important is not just too early to study sanctions. It's also important that you need to be very smart and need to track sanctions countries' strategic response. And there is a recent paper which looks at pre-22 sanctions post Post 2014, sorry, it's a mistake. It's post 2014 sanctions. And uh, this paper by Jamiliana Nigmatulina shows that Russian government actually protects sanctioned firms. And eventually, if you actually look at sanctioned firms, they benefit from sanctions. The, the economy in total actually loses from sanctions. But those firms which are sanctioned are actually benefiting from state protection and grow even faster than they would have been uh, without sanctions. So there are, there, it's a very complex issue, and uh, we still lack good research on sanctions, which is normal, also because previous sanctions were quite small, and so uh, impact of previous sanctions was, uh, was uh, uh, very small relative to to what, what's happened before. So um, I'm happy to talk about uh, specific issues resulted to what has happened to Russian economy uh, more recently. Uh, and uh, yet I think I, I'm out of time. So if you have questions about this, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this, but let me conclude. So basically to wrap up, I, I talk about four things, populism, autocracies, wars, and sanctions. Populism, we live in unprecedented in the times of unprecedented rise of populism. Economic consequences of populism are negative. We live in the in terms of rise of uh, economic weight of autocracies, which is unprecedented, and economic consequences of autocracies relative to dem Democrats, also negative, also same range, 1% of GDP per year. Um, Full-scale wars are really bad for GDP, for productivity, for inflation, especially if they happen on your territory. And uh, finally, rise of sanctions is also unprecedented. But it's uh, there is not much of research of recent sanctions, simply because the recent sanctions just happened. And it's very hard to measure their impact yet. So I'll stop here and I'll take your questions. Thank you, Professor Gurio, for an extremely interesting talk. We can now open for questions. If you raise your hand, if you have a question, we'll come with the mic. Uh, thank you, uh, Jethro Barrel, University of Glasgow. Um, way back on slide 20, you presented the effect of uh, left and right wing populism on uh, uh, GDP. But with the left wing populists, there seemed to be some huge rebound after 10 years. Uh, what's going on there? Right. Uh, this is the average. Uh, uh, that's the average impact on. Uh, 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 that's the average impact. So they summarize uh, whatever twenty populists. So the whole the whole data is like fifty populists in power. So each each of those is uh, twenty five or twenty or twenty five, and so probably there should be some normalization after seven or eight years of populist in power. So something like this. Uh, 
uh, but then uh, there is inheritance of the first uh, the first uh, populist administration. So uh, I think when we talk about left wing populists, we do talk mostly about irresponsible macroeconomic management. And there, in this book by Dornbush and uh, Edwards, the book is about the cycle. And the cycle is uh, people are unhappy, uh, incomes are not growing, inequality is high, populists are elected, populists promise a lot, populists print a lot of money, uh, before inflation kicks in, everybody's happy, and suddenly inflation kicks in, um, uh, investment stops, real wages start to fall, People are unhappy, reasonable administrations brought in, stops the inflation, economy starts growing, but uh, there is an inheritance of problems and new populists come in, something like this. Or the uh, incumbent reasonable government starts, starts printing money again, something like this. So I think this is, this is the story. And we actually, what is very interesting, which we are observing right now, I mentioned Turkey. So in Turkey, for many, many years, Erdogan said, I don't believe in uh, first-year macroeconomics. He fired many responsible uh, macro policy makers. And suddenly last year, he brought them back again. And they are now starting to fight inflation. Inflation is very stubborn. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. So it comes and goes. Uh, but basically, in left-wing populism, I think uh, uh, we need to pretty much stop by the first five, six years, because in 20th century, and this is the data set which starts in the 20th century, right? Uh, in 20th century, the normal cycle of populist government was shorter than uh, 10 or 15 years. So, yeah. Um, hello, my name is Karim. Thanks for the presentation. Um, at the end, you mentioned uh, you're talking about sanctions. and. There's been talk recently about using um, future revenue of sanctioned assets to to be able to assist Ukraine. Also, what is your thought on this, and also on the on the risk that it carries by using projected revenues? Right. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, basically, one of the things which uh, has happened was indeed unprecedented freeze of uh, Russian central bank assets, three hundred billion dollars. So it's very hard to expropriate this money. It's a substantial amount of money when we talk about helping Ukraine. Ukrainian budget deficit is in the range of uh, 30, 50 billion per year. Uh, American military aid, as we saw, is also about 50 billion per year. So 300 billion represents a major, major pool of resources for both financing Ukraine now and for reconstructing Ukraine after the war. And so the West is correctly looking at those resources, asking, can we actually use those resources? And basically, the position is we cannot confiscate uh, uh, somebody else's money without a court decision. And this court decision is going to be uh, uh, late. So maybe we use financial engineering, which is we take money now, assuming that this court decision will expropriate uh, Russian assets and give them back to Ukraine. And uh, that is quite likely. I, uh, I evaluate uh, this uh, court decision as very highly likely decision because uh, a every reasonable court will look at what's happened and will blame Russia for destruction in Ukraine and will oblige Russia to pay for destruction of Ukraine. So this money will eventually be transferred to Ukraine. But actually, at this particular moment, we don't even know which court Ukraine should go to uh, and how this all going to proceed. Uh, but overall, I think everybody shares this view that this risk of uh, not getting Russian funds is actually quite minimal. So for me, it's, it's a reasonable discussion. And so the Western coalition can say Ukraine can issue bonds using future Russian uh, confiscated assets as a collateral. So I think I think we'll see what the market says. Uh, there is one scenario where these bonds are issued by Ukrainian government's promise, and we'll see what market uh, prices in as the risk that you mentioned. Or uh, we can also see a solution where the West issues guarantees. So Ukraine issues bonds uh, using G7 guarantees and G7 on its own 
uh, 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 on its own timing hopes to re 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 retrieve those assets. So the question is whether a market has or doesn't have, say, U.S. government or G7 government's guarantees and not just the promise that at some point Ukraine will get Russian assets. So this is slightly different. But if those bonds are issued, we'll see uh, how market prices in those risks. Hello. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. I have two questions regarding the methodology of the construction of the synthetic counterfactual or, or the doppelganger as in the presentation. So the first question would be how was the similarity of the two, uh, let's say time series was, was computed because uh, on, well, on face value, the two time series may look very similar, but the underlying dynamics could be completely different. And the second one is, uh, well, if some countries or some economies are similar to, uh, let's say for the case of Brexit, to Britain's economy, there's a high possibility that these countries are trading partners of UK. So if Brexit affects Britain, it's likely that it also affects the trading partners, or in other sense, uh, after the uh, impactful event, the counterfactual, I'm not sure if it can be completely uh, trusted. Or, so, thank you. I, I agree with all these concerns. This is exactly right. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is why it's important to take a large data set large pool of similar countries. And this particular case, as I mentioned, they just take pretty much all high income OECD countries and then endogenously calculate uh, the weights. And you're right, Britain has highest weights in the US or Anglo-Saxon countries in general because the economies are somewhat similar in structure in growth trajectory. Interestingly, the biggest UK trading partner before Brexit was, of course, EU. And uh, these uh, continental European countries would have low weight. So your concern is actually, in this particular case, is not justified. But generally, it is justified. And that would mean that you underestimate the gap. Because indeed, uh, as you rightly said, uh, the trading partners would also be affected by Brexit, they would slow down as well. So I, I fully agree with you. This method is highly imperfect. It's, however, it has this benefit, and it's a re reasonably recent method. It, it's been promoted since 15 years ago by Abad, Alberto Abadi and other econometricians. It's used a lot, as I've shown you, it's used everywhere now. And uh, when I worked in the BRD, we also did quite a bit of work with this method. What is good about this method, it's highly transparent. Everybody can do it. Uh, uh, in this particular case, the counterfactual is chosen based on GDP, but you can also choose similar economies based on several characteristics. You can say, okay, GDP level, but also geographic uh, location, but also demographic structure, but also education levels. And if you don't want trading partners, you can exclude trading partners. So these things you can actually construct in the way you want. But in this particular case, it was exactly, as I said, very, very, very simple. And that makes it very transparent. And that gives you something that every policymaker wants to know. Because the policymakers would pose you a question, would raise a question. What would have happened to UK economy if not for Brexit? And you say, uh, I don't know. They would say, OK, let's look at a similar economy. Let's look at the U.S. economy. You you compare that, but then of course it's it's much worse than what uh, we are doing here, which is not just one U.S. economy, but a weighted average of all economies, and the doppelganger is as similar as it could have been in terms of GDP. So in this sense, in this sense, of course it's not perfect, and it, it, the the correct method cannot be found because there are so many factors that may affect GDP before and after Brexit, I fully agree. Uh, but this is just a very simple, transparent, and for policymakers, very convincing method. Thank you. 
Sadly, we don't have any more time left for question, but I'm sure you want to join me in thanking Professor Guriel for this wonderful talk. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you very much. And again, sorry for not being with you. Thank you.